We are live on the internet. Woo! What How's is up? Now? How's it going, Brett? Good to see you. Hey, normal. Hey. Nice, nice to have you. I'm, I'm excited for another show with the two of us. Yes. Riffing on knowledge that Ooh. we sometimes have. Ooh. I'm excited to learn something today from you. <laughs> Just so you know, internet, we've got some AWS people too. So I, I come in. So Nermal's bringing the heat with the guests, and uh, we're. Ex I'm excited because he's got some. He's got some access, and we're gonna we're gonna learn some things that I've needed to know for a while now. And we're gonna talk yeah. about some, some things that I'm excited about. Not this show, but coming soon. <laughs> coming soon. So what is this show, Brett? Where are we? What's we're on the on? internet, and yeah. we're supposed to talk about Compose today. I mean, if you're showing up and you didn't actually click, like, read the description. It's about Compose. It's your catch-up show. It's gonna, not, not the ketchup is in like made from tomatoes, <laughs> but ketchup with a C. Normally in this, this channel, every word we use has a K in it because it's Kubernetes related, but not today. It's gonna be C. Oh, let's see if that works out. Yeah, Because there up. is a Compose with a K, but it's a different thing. Yes. It does how about, something different. How about catching up? Catching yeah. up. There we go. We're the catch-up, we're the catching up show. Yes. Um, hello everyone. <laughs> In the chat, let me just um, say hi to a few of my friends on the internet there. Johan's here. Um, oh, look, Nermal's here. Uh, Ben's here from Cleveland. The Black Forest. That sounds That sounds like a place I, I'm scared of. Martin. Martin and Max. Some of the regulars are here. Alexandru. All of my friends. Hello, people. And now Nermal's friends. And Dan is here. Some of these people are actually from our Discord. Hey, did you know we have a Discord? It's right over there on Nermal's head. Oh, am I um, going to get this right? There we go. Yes. There we go. <laughs> You're pretty good because after five years, I still get this wrong. I still go <laughs> over there. Um, <laughs> and we have all these. We have all these places that you can come and hang out with us. So we have a newsletter. You know, you see the Brett Live. That's where we're at now. That's just in case you were curious. You're we're, on the Brett Live. We're here. We're right there. And we have a Brett.news, which is not listed up there, which totally should be. But that's the, that's the newsletter that you would have gotten last night that told you not just about what this show's going to be about, but it would have told you about two new Docker announcements that I feel like, hey, look, we're not a news show. Like, Nermal and I aren't here to list the Internet's accomplishments this week. But <laughs> we're, we're going to do that for a second. <laughs> because we have... We have a Discord server where you could discuss all these things over on the cloud native DevOps server, just to prove that it's real. This is it. And we just had our 250th stream last week. So I had to celebrate that. I put a yes. little clip out there. Um, Nermal and I awesome. going down memory lane of yeah. 250 weeks of this show. So yay. Ooh. That was a really um, good. That was a really good session. So I, I love memory lanes. Like when we talk about the old days, they always you know, the rose colored glasses. We always think like, oh, that was so wonderful. In reality, back then we were, <laughs> we thought it was chaos. I, yeah, I like memory lanes if they increase my memory bandwidth. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yes. So this turns into a podcast, not every show, only the best shows, only when we have guests or there's something significant for you to learn. And so that's in your favorite podcast player. Just look up my name, look up Nermal's name, look up, you know, I don't know, maybe the title, DevOps and Docker Talk, uh, which rolls off the tongue like butter. So you can do that. You can listen in. I mean, one of my favorite episodes, which I, we need to have an, I need to have an episode on here where I talk about the favorite episodes and have clips. All the great shows do that. Are we it's gonna have a clip work. show? Do we need it's to a lot do of a work. clip show? <laughs> we could do a clip show. Let us know. But like we had Brendan Burns on last. Show. Yeah. Yeah. You were on that one, right? No, uh, Matt Williams no. was here. Yeah. We had a we, we had a packed audience. You yes. missed that one. So sorry you missed that one. It's all good. Um, I'm here now. <laughs> but you're on the da you were on the dagger show. Yes. Look at that. That was a really good one. Did you know you could do this? You can drill down in the normal on our podcast website and by the way, he former model turned IT guy. Um, and you can see all the shows that he was a part of. So if you really prefer Nermal 
<laughs> over my rhetoric and soapbox stuff, you can just look at his stuff. Here, in fact, here wow. in chat, I will give you this link. <laughs> Caesar, Caesar, what's Thank up, you. Robert? Hey, uh, go to that link and listen to the normal episodes. They're really the, the kind of the best ones. I mean, if you kind of look at the statistics, it's probably oh, it's you're probably all in there. Heart you, Brett. Heart you. I'm buttering <laughs> you up. I'm buttering you up. Um, so, so speaking of uh, some of the updates, um, I am speaking at KubeCon EU. So um, if you are going to be at KubeCon EU, not only will you be able to meet Brett and I somewhere like around, <laughs> I think as we get closer, we'll figure out where we're going to be, but um, we'll be we'll be doing a live show in the expo. So come hang out, um, come say hello. Um, I. I you know, from our experience from KubeCon back in what was that November in Chicago, it seems like both of us are really appro pretty approachable. So um, if you're a fan of Brett, if you're a fan of the show, um, if you don't know who we are, <laughs> uh, come, come come say hello um, and uh, let us know what um, what you're excited about at KubeCon EU. And also check out the session I'm uh, presenting with. Uh, this uh with shahar from um ground cover um which maybe maybe we'll have on the show i don't know i don't know yet um but uh see you in paris um so check that out um i guess that these were all announced is that yes to talk the about schedule it? the schedule for kubecon the main schedule was released yesterday uh so um you can go check out uh i think i'm speaking on the wednesday I'm trying to look don't up. quote me on that don't quote me on that yeah i should have i should have had the link um uh, oh there it is okay i'm yeah. trying to find it and the nice thing is is all, everything that's showing up is you and me on the show so <laughs> uh that's a good sign yeah but there's um there's a schedule there we go. Troubleshooting hidden performance and costs in network traffic across multiple az's that's with ebpf dude that's Sounds like a mouthful, and it sounds amazing. What did you and I say at KubeCon in Chicago? EBPF, all the things, like everything. EBPF, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of EBPF sessions at this at, uh, KubeCon Paris. But um, yeah, so that's just in like a month and a half, maybe. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're still working out hell hotels, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're if you're gonna if you're planning on being at KubeCon. Um, the co-located events the, uh, in Paris in mid-March. Um, come find us. Come say hello. Um, come hang out. We'll be there. Yep, we will. And I see you, Dave, in chat saying, please do more Nomad. So we got a Nomad fan in there. Uh, ah. We might actually mention Swarm a few times today because there, there have been actually Swarm updates in the Docker engine. So I'm almost feeling like we could have made the whole episode about the announcements this week, but it's two things. But what we're going to do is we're going to make separate specific episodes for that, that Normal and I will, we will learn stuff and, and educate you. Yes. Um, but besides KubeCon, Docker announced a significant, basically a whole new cloud feature, a whole new cloud website this week. Mm -hmm. They're calling it Docker Build Cloud, which we kind of known about for at least six months. They, they pre-announced it at DockerCon and sort of a... They uh, alluded vaporware to format, yeah. <laughs> early access for special individuals. Before that, they had had it for a couple of months internally with the Docker captains. This is, in my opinion, assuming I have still have the minutes, this will be the only way I build Docker containers now. Like especially if I'm shipping them, or if I want other people to use them, because it has native builders for ARM and Intel, so you get both architectures built concurrently without QEMU, which in, in a lot of my cases is really slow, especially when you're having QEMU need to build an extension or something where it has to actually bring out build utilities. It, it can be quite slow. And this thing has its own console now. So you can go to build.docker.com or in Docker Desktop, you have a new builder tab and it's slick. I mean, this is like the future of Docker we're looking at here where they now have a scout website. There's hub hub.docker.com there's scout.docker.scout.docker.com uh, scout say quick, and now say there's quick. <laughs> yeah say it too too fast and you get tongue tied we've got build.docker.com and 
in your Docker CLI or in your Docker Hub or in your GitHub Action, not Docker Hub, sorry, in your Docker Desktop or in your CI, including GitHub Actions, which they already have this enabled for their GitHub Actions. Huge fan. I talk about GitHub Actions for Docker a lot. So across all these places and more, you can simply switch your context in your CLI or in the CI to build in Docker's cloud. Now, the, the, the sweet thing here is that you don't have to change your CI. You can leave your CI in place and simply let it connect to Docker's build cloud, do the builds more efficiently on bigger machines that are more native and fancier. Mm -hmm. Probably, I'm going to guess, they're probably using Graviton on the back end. We'll talk about that sometime in the future. Maybe, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, maybe. Um, I can't speak to that. So <laughs> I, 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 I can't either, but why shouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? I mean, Graviton's awesome. Yes. Um, but they're definitely using ARM native builders, and you get a certain amount of minutes. So it's kind of like any other CI tool out yeah. there, like GitHub or uh, GitLab, where you, yeah. you get limits based on your on your plan, and you sort of you basically start free. Everybody with the starter plan gets free a certain number of minutes, and then you can upgrade from there. There's actually you know you buy into more minutes and more basically more storage. And this isn't just a cloud builder. This is why it's going to change the game for me is even just as an individual, I get a shared cache across everything I'm doing. So if I'm building locally, I'm also using that image layer cache that all my GitHub action builders that are building all my, my images for my courses and stuff, it's all tied into this storage thing. So when you see this 50 gig shared storage cache, that's for me. That's just for yeah. me, the individual for free. Yeah. And I now get all that if... I switch my Docker CLI and my CI to use this cloud, and it's like a one line. It's like a one line change. It's not anyway. much of a change, and we shouldn't we shouldn't sleep on multi arch. Um, I think that's that was a that's continued to be a trend over the last few years, and I think this year with folks trying to figure out how to optimize their cost, um, get more performance. Uh, more folks developing on like you know m series max um yep. iot like uh yeah um we're we're hopefully gonna get some guests to talk more about arm and uh and multi-arch so let, let us know people. in the chat and on the count in the comments if um if there's specific topics within multi-arch that that y'all are interested in hearing about, but um, yeah, that's the, and I love that there's like this smoothness of using that that cloud build. Um, like you don't have to change too much. Frictionless, I think is the, Ooh, the word. Yeah. <laughs> Frictionless uh, builds, um, especially cause like we kind of take for granted like building and the, like even small improvements in the time of those very repetitive tasks go a long way um, in terms of like performance and cost and all that jazz. So yeah, I don't build it. I don't make a Docker file now. I mean, I haven't for years that I can't multi architecture build. And it sometimes like if you're a Go or a Rust or a C person, it tends to just work. I mean, technically Go can build for different architectures with without being on that architecture. So that's really sweet. Yeah. I'm just, I don't even know if Rust can do it. I'm not a Rust person yet. Um, You're not Rusty. I'm not Rusty. But there's a lot of nuance to it. So we could do Rest. a whole episode on how, like the. I have this GitHub repo that is a deep dive into all the different architecture types if you want to get really nerdy and exactly what the Docker variables mm -hmm. and architecture options are and how they work in terms of there's subtle little nuances that change depending on your Linux distro or which architecture you're on. Um, and I mean, it's just a lot. I, I did this deep dive and wrote it all up. I, when, I remember when I wrote it, it was only half of the things I was wanting to write because I still have a like whip area <laughs> that I never went through. But this is all just like crazy. And this is just one part of the multi-architecture problem. And I felt like it wasn't in the docs well enough and it wasn't uh, as well defined yeah. in terms of, hey, you know, in some places, ARM64 is actually referred to as ARCH64. And sometimes ARM is also ARMHF in terms of architecture type. So there's all this right. weird, like, yeah. But there is, but stuff. at the same time, like, 
now's the time. Like it's also a lot yeah. easier. <laughs> I, I would agree. I would agree. Uh, so yeah, we're definitely doing a show on that this year. Yeah. Like you and I, we, let's write this down. I'm, I'm writing on my pretend uh, pad of paper that I don't have. Um, do a multi art show. Bring the knowledge. Bring you know. Bring the people. It'll probably have to be more than an hour. We'll probably have to like dedicate. We'll have to make a special show where it's like this long format <laughs> education. All right. Sorry. Alrighty. We're gonna so, we're gonna we're gonna fly through the next announcement because we should have a whole show on this. Docker release. Docker engine v25. Version 25, the next major release of Docker Engine and Docker CLI. And it's not like shout it from the rooftops level cool features, but what are some in cool this features? week's blog, if you went to the newsletter, this is the week of Docker new. And I don't know why I put cool pineapples, but they were cool pineapples. So I just did that. Um, <laughs> but I detail some of my favorite new features in the new Docker engine. Pick one. And pick one. Pick one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to resist the swarm ones because I'd love to talk about those. Um, I can now finally specify multiple networks in a run command. Um, so before you could specify, my understanding is you could specify a network, but then if you wanted to attach or connect other networks in the Docker networks, you needed to do that after the fact with Docker Network Connect. And now you can do that in the command line. The one other one little thing I'll, I'll throw out is, I mean, there's there's GPU stuff in here. There's read-only bind mounts that are recursive now. But the other little thing, and I can't resist just doing one, one, one right? Uh, I can't even behave. Um, the start interval. So health checks in Docker, which aren't the same as Kubernetes probes, but in Docker health right. checks for Docker engine, there's now an option so that you can basically when you're considered starting during the starting period for your container, you can have the health check now go like every three seconds. And then once it recognizes that it's available, it slows down to the normal health check interval, which is pretty slick, pretty sweet. And yeah. that's now built in by default. So I, I like that. that. That's that, that's a tricky area as well. Like health checks, readiness probes, all that kind of stuff. Like those questions come up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all righty. So why are we here? Yeah, what's new in Compose? <laughs> so, all right. Compose has been sneaking out little features in releases for years now. And I had to go back. And the the real big change was them. Now, granted, they have been doing this actually forever. I, I mean, I think there was maybe only like a year there in the last decade where they kind of, a year or two where they kind of slowed down and went to sleep a little bit on the Compose command line. But... When I say compose, I'm really talking about the file format and the command line because they're, they're, sometimes the feature involves both. Sometimes the yeah. new feature or the new option is only one or the other. It doesn't really affect the, the YAML spec and the CLI. But for the point of this conversation, let's just say it's both. We're talking about both. And if you go back to 2022, wasn't that long ago, just a couple of years, they shipped V2, which was a technically a complete rewrite of Docker Compose. Correct. And you and I maybe have referred to this in the past as this is the Docker space compose, not the Docker dash compose. <laughs> totally Which, different. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the names of things over the years have got pretty blurry. So um, it's uh, uh, 22 was a, is a, was a big change with respect to that. So, so what was, what was the impetus behind that? Do you know, Brett, like why? Why the major overhaul, new version? Um, they wanted, so the old version was Python. Mm -hmm. And originally, before Compose was even called Compose, it was written in Python. And I think if you go back in Docker Engine, all the way back to the early, early, it was also Python. Like the original Docker people were all Python fans. Um, it, was it a Python or Bash script? I feel like... Ex 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 Docker was Python and Kubernetes used to be Bash and it's very early pre-release, like internal. Anyway, I may be wrong, internet. That may be a lie. Um, but they, they, they had all these libraries that Docker and Compose needed to have that were very similar. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of creating double duty. Like they had to write it in Golang for Docker Run and Docker CLI and all those commands. And then they had to write it in, in Python for Compose stuff. And then they had this Compose library for uh, and libcompose, and that was in, in Python. 
Well, they wanted to synergize, which makes sense. And they're, and all the developers for Docker are all big Go bands. So they wanted to write Compose and Go. And honestly, this was started in 2016. If you remember, when we were in Berlin, they announced yes. that they were deprecating Lib Compose and moving to Go. But that didn't happen till six years later. I can remember actually walking down the street in Berlin, talking to Le, uh, Laura Taco about mm -hmm. her the job she was working at. They automated a lot of things with the Lib Compose library at a little company she worked at called Code. Uh, shoot, what was it called? <laughs> it was a CI company. I can't remember the name of it now. It was per <laughs> it was purchased by uh, the Jenkins company, CloudBees. Um, yes. Anyway. <laughs> and they were using Lib Compose, and that was 2016. So fast forward to 2022, it finally gets to release as a brand new, and they're calling it Compose V2, not to be related with the Compose YAML file format version V2, totally not related. Mm -hmm. And it's now Docker Space Compose. So all Coach this it. new effort in the last two years has been to enhance that Go, the, those Go binaries and Go libraries that are we can now run from the Docker command line. So that that company was Codeship. Code ship. That's it. Deep, <laughs> deep cuts. Code ship. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of history here. And maybe people don't realize how many things Compose now does that it didn't do just two years ago or three years ago. So <laughs> Max is saying, let's go. Let's go. Oh, hey, thanks for the super chat. <laughs> Humph gave us a super chat. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So let's just start. <laughs> if you want a really kind of um, cheesy way of going through all this, we could just go through the release notes and just scroll, yeah. scroll. That's not, that's not what folks are here for. Come that's on. not what they're here for. This is a very effective way if you just skim it, but right. it doesn't really explain things, which is why we're here, right? We're here to explain things. And right. so I'm going to start and go back in time um, because I don't want do to, to do where do you like, start? Do we, to, do we have to do like that? <laughs> this is a, this yes. is a X gen uh, <laughs> reference to an old movie. Um, so the, we have some stuff that's experimental and we have some coming soon. So I'm, I'm not going to bury the lead. I want to talk about like coming soon, experimental stuff first in case okay. we run out of time. Cause we do, we are not unlimited on time here. And then we're going to go back in time. And as you're watching people, when we get to the stuff that you're already like, ah, I've heard of this, I use it all day long, then maybe we're go we've gone years back and we're sort of into the area that you would know about with new Compose. Because I talk a lot about Compose here. So, so I'm, about once I'm a waiting. Year. I'm waiting on bated breath. What's bated this breath. new, the experimental stuff? Yeah, so if we, if we go over to... I can find my Visual Studio. And so if we go over to Visual Studio, um, we have this new thing. So remember Docker Space Compose, that's like the first thing we should all make sure we're doing. Because if you use the dash, technically what happens now if you're on the latest Docker desktop is if you use dash, it's just an alias to the space. It doesn't really run the old CLI that's been deprecated and removed. Um, that all happened last year where they kind of fully deprecated, fully end of life kind of thing. <clears throat> All right, so Docker Compose Alpha is where you can read the tea leaves to see what is coming. And right now there are three commands and a new option. Ooh. And these are things that they, the reason they put them under the alpha command line op, op, argument or option, I guess yeah. it's argument. Um, is because they may be changing the name of the command or the options for those commands, and they don't they don't want to have to worry about backwards compatibility. So the rule is, is if it's under the alpha command line, it could it could change at any moment, and n no one has to apologize. Um, so we have typical, this publish typical disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, it's a disclaimer. So this is like the bleeding edge experimental use at your own peril. May not even be feature complete, like the first one, which is this is a thing I've been asking for for like six years, um, and it's not fully baked. But we can. I was actually in the captain's chat right before this, asking Docker employees and other captains, like, "Hey, how does this exactly work in at the end of this feature set? Because I don't. 
It doesn't work like I expect it to work. And it turns out it's because it's not finished. It's not fully realized. But publish allows us to take the compose file and ship it as an artifact to Docker Hub or your own registry. Mm -hmm. And we can do that with you if you think about it, a lot of their tools like Hub, sorry, not Hub, Helm. If we all think of Helm, Helm has this idea of charts being stored in places. And we've now had yes. two different formats in Helm for that where we can yes. we can store it super in a web simple, server. Super simple, super straightforward, yeah. easy to understand. You can list charts and you can have chart, um, is it, is it chart registries? I'm trying to think of there's, I feel like there's another term for chart, uh, chart repositories. But we didn't really have that with Compose. So now there's a couple of things in Compose that are starting to, see, we're starting to see the light of day with where we're going to be eventually able to store Compose YAML in registries as artifacts, which means other people can then run our Compose apps without needing to clone a repo or download a YAML file, which was always the problem before. If you think about, giving Docker to the people, to the people like that aren't watching this show that aren't fully just invested like, in Docker. Yeah, or just between me and you. Like if I wanted to send you. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't want to have to clone the repo or maybe the repo's private just because you have the source code not necessarily public or it's behind a firewall and you just want someone to be able to launch it or maybe your Docker hub is private because you can put it in a private hub repository. But you can now have the compose file separate and you know, you don't have to necessarily put it in a separate Git repo. That's up to you. But you can now do a Docker Compose Alpha push or publish rather. Sorry, publish. The push is different. Publish. And it packages it up in an OCI artifact, which I've talked about recently in our newsletter. Hey, get on the newsletter, people. Um, we talked about the newsletter. And that publish wraps it up in a consistent format. And then, and then presumably, eventually, not yet, but eventually, you can maybe do a Docker Compose up with a URL. And uh, that's so not baked in yet. It's like the packet. Yeah, but you can, it makes sense that something like that would, would be in the future, right? And I think a lot of us have been in a situation where we have to hunt down the compose file for like a stack of different components that are packaged yeah. together. Yeah, And it's like in a readme somewhere. It's like, you don't know what, if that's like the latest version, yeah. Um, don't know if it's representative of like the best way to like the best configuration. Uh, it's it's tough right now. It's just kind of wild west, right? So this will hopefully get to a point where people start store like writing and storing their compose files as these and these assets that are more canonical, right, and more representative right. and um, can be shared as as representations of how this piece of uh, these components need to be deployed. Yeah, the um, I have a I think I thought I had an example, but I cleared it. Um, let's do this one. But if you do, you can like if I'm in here and I and in this directory I have a compose YAML file, I can do mm -hmm. a Docker compose. Alpha. Alpha, publish, and you can see this ex this command, and when I do that, uh, it 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 says a lot of things, and I'm not exactly understanding all of it yet. <laughs> There's no <laughs> documentation because it's alpha. Where is That's it one going? Of the indicators. There's no docs. Where is it going? Where did it yeah. get published to? <laughs> so, well, Docker Hub, okay. because I'm using the Docker Hub friendly format instead of the full URL. I could, and it and it look and what it does is it. Like it gives me this weird warning, and then I, I went and actually tried to inspect this file and this in the repo. Uh, you can actually over here. I have. Oh, there's some weird line edit issues. <laughs> New line issues there too. Yeah, I got it. Where is this? I got so many windows open. So this is what it does. It pushes this. We we, we can't really call it a container image. It's just an artifact. And in fact, it it indicates, I thought somewhere it said something about it was an art. Oh yeah, right here. It actually has this little tag that says artifact. That's the only indicator that it's not a container image. It's, so this is likely going to change in the future. <laughs> and it has a tag of the latest because I didn't give it a tag. I just get, you know, I 
gave it the default one. And I can't really look at it. Like there's nothing to look at. There's no UI. Um, dive doesn't work with it. I can't inspect it. I can't even pull it. If I try to pull it with a Docker, uh, if I try to go back to, to Docker, if I just do a Docker pull, it actually says uh, it is not an OCI image, so I can't pull it into the image cache, which is technically what a Docker pull command is doing is it's it's pulling down the, the tarballs, storing them in the image cache, but it has to, it has to be a container image. So we're, we're gonna, they're gonna need more commands, and I've mm -hmm. confirmed that they're still trying to figure all that out. But what it can yep. do today, well, one thing is you can do is you can do a dry run, which kind of came out around the same time, and dry run is starting to work in more commands, so you can see what an up might do or a publish might do without actually like we've had all we've all had this in Kubernetes for years, so it's finally yeah. coming to compose. Um, and the other thing you can do with publish is something we'll hopefully mention later is the new includes feature, and that's in compose YAML. We can basically include compose files or link to them, refer to them oh, inside so of other like compose files. So you can do a dependency, like you can do dependency, like complex dependencies between Compose yep. files, essentially. And, and it doesn't, and so those, yeah, and those dependencies don't have to be a file in your current directory. They could be in a Git repo, and they can also mm -hmm. be in Docker Hub as one of these artifacts. Um, if we get time to talk about includes and go down the deep dive rabbit hole, includes could probably be its own episode on this show, but... Um, Includes allows an, a lot more advanced, complex compose stuff where if you're in a microservice architecture and you have dozens of images, you could create separate, if you can imagine each team in your environment has, or in your uh, company rather, each team has their own compose file. And then you have like a master compose file with this main one that includes all the other ones. And then you don't yeah. have to have a giant compose file with a thousand lines in it. So interesting. That's what, that's what includes does. But if we go back to this real quick, Viz, we're not going to talk about Viz, but this uses GraphViz, which is basically text to images. Uh, a lot of people do this for network diagrams. There's also, you, you've heard of Mermaid probably. I think, I feel like mm -hmm. GraphViz has been around a lot longer, but Mermaid has sort of captured the heart and minds of the internet, I feel like. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to throw in a request that they don't just include GraphViz, but they also do Mermaid support. So if I did this Viz command, um, by the way, I, I actually created this complex. So you can technically do something like this. I'm just going to throw this example in here. Let's, with, with, let's see Brett's gnarly <laughs> compose file visualized. <laughs> yeah, so so this unfortunately doesn't work in this uh, because VS Code doesn't support ImageCat. So, so I'm piping the output. So if I just, let me should back up. Docker Compose Alpha Viz gives yep. me, oh, to be in the right place. Yeah, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong one. Okay, this one. Docker compose alpha viz. Let me put it at the top there. Um, so yeah, it gives me this text to image. So it doesn't really give me the image. I have to pipe that output into um, into the actual. If you're someone who knows GraphViz, there's a dot cli. And I'm saying, make it a PNG file. So I'm piping this in through Linux. Uh, I give it a high DPI so it looks really pretty and smooth. And then on my machine, I also have another utility called ImageCat, which allows me to show images in a shell. Um, but it doesn't work in this shell in, in VS Code. <laughs> so it will show nothing. Um, but you know, if I, I could do something like pipe that out to that and, and then, then that um i'd have to bring that up in a browser i'm not ready for that demo <laughs> um because <laughs> i if i just do open it's not going to show up in this in this uh in this browser but anyway oh well maybe um maybe that's not true if i go up here yeah there we go unable to load in initial data okay so it's not making a png that's weird it's not that it's not weird. a legit png Oh, we're, oh, you you ran it in the, did you run it in the right? It is. Doing it live. Yeah. This is, Doing this it live. is why y'all anyway, are here. Anyway, it's a really basic image. It's not exciting to look at. 
Uh, the Viz is not that interesting to me, so we're moving on. Uh, <laughs> but it makes it makes sense with respect to the include, right? So let's you want to go to yeah. include because if you then start, if we're on the path where we have complex dependencies between compose files, then it makes sense to start having a visualization of those complex compose files and their dependencies, correct? Yeah, the um, the, the bigger your file, like all these other, so someone's uh, Comlin's asking, is it is the the includes similar to Docker override? So there's all these options now. There's at least three major ways you can include the other Docker file, Docker compose files with a Docker compose file, or merge them, extend mm -hmm. them, include them. There's all these different ways, and so you can imagine as people's environments get more and more complex and everything's in a bunch of different compose files. We've had for a while the docker compose config command, which is very helpful in that situation. Um, because config will output, and it's basically rendering all the YAML, and that's not new. But if we did that, um, it would, I don't know if I, oh, I'm in the wrong directory again, doggone it. Anyway, I, I would render, a compose file and all the files that it includes. And then you can see how you might want to pipe that into a visualization. I'm not sure if the right. visualization does the rendering as well, if the, the viz command, but I could see how, I mean, I've worked with a few teams where they have dozens and dozens of microservices and they would need this to make sense of everything. What I'm not right. seeing in this is like links or relationships. So I'm not really sure how that, like a bunch of objects just listed in circles on a Doesn't diagram doesn't Those help really me. so i need to understand yeah. relationships and i don't know how that works so yeah yay it's all right so then there was this other third command there there's viz yeah, and so, then there was watch maybe yep and um watch is technically gra graduated alpha but i think they're including it still here just so that anyone who was using it before it still works so watch if you just do um docker compose I think I, yeah, I just spit out the commands. You can see watch here. So watch mm -hmm. is something I've made shorts on this. I've talked about this in other videos on YouTube. Yep. Uh, watch, I call it sync, Docker Compose sync, but it's a fantastic way to S -Y -N -C. avoid bind mounts. Was that, yeah. <laughs> Not <-sync>. S-I-N-K. <laughs> um, and that one goes back a few years actually. So watch is one of those things where if you're on a big project and you didn't know that there was a way around your bind mount performance problem, especially if you're talking about installing dependencies or do, or building anything or doing, maybe you're someone who's creating a front end website and you have to generate a bunch of CSS or you wanna minify a bunch of JavaScript, that can be really yep. slow across bind mounts, especially if you're on Mac. And this watch command is essentially a sync. It's a one-way sync that allows you to, mm -hmm. to specify it in a YAML file and then synchronize files from the host into the container as they change in real time. This is also similar to something called Mutagen. There's also something called Docker. There's a third party tool. I think it's like Docker sync or something that's been around for years. Lots of ways to do this, solve this problem, but now it's included yep. in Compose. That's really awesome. And we, I think we had a question about the Mutagen, um, acquisition. <laughs> um recently and and what might be coming out of that so probably something to keep an eye out for in the future around some more features in that space for sure yeah all right yeah. so someone, someone asked in chat by the way I'm, I'm trying to answer questions uh as they come in yeah um dan saying can we deploy my docker compose to kubernetes yet no, and I'm not even sure they're ever going to do that. They've been working on that in three different ways and three different projects for the last seven, eight years, and they've never really shipped a, a long-term supportable solution for Compose to Kubernetes. Someone, uh, Nerma, actually, was it you <laughs> that mentioned <laughs> Compose with a K, which is just a translator. It just converts, yes. but not not. It's the closest thing. I, yes. Technically, in the Compose spec, there is a way. For this to work, but it's, I don't think they're going to ship it. I mean, I just keep asking. I've been asking for six, seven years, like every year <laughs> I ask and it doesn't get shipped. So my, my short answer is not, not built not in. Likely. Yeah. Not built into the, you, you could technically build compose separately. And my understanding is 
you can do that. You can, can build, you enable some build flags and it will enable these features. And there's, but I, I haven't done that in years. I don't even know if it's still included in the spec. Um, it's just not there. Um, there are, by the way, places like, I think it's Ufizi and a couple of other startups that have been on this show that they have tools that allow mm -hmm. you to, especially for ephemeral environments and like setup and staging and whatnot, that you can deploy your Compose app. And technically in the background, they're running it all on Kubernetes, but you don't have to care because you just wanted an environment running your app and you're using a Compose file to do it. So there's, I think Lifecycle does that. Like there's just a lot of these tools. Um, yeah. Another one we've had on the show is um, Octeto. Octeto does that. Oh, um, yeah. I could I could go on and on. There's at least three or four companies that have been on this show that can all do that um, with Compose files, but they don't they don't go to the production. They're not meant to like deploy Compose into a Kubernetes production environment. They're more for testing and dev stuff. Yeah, I, that's that's what I see it being asked for a lot of time is like the local development environment. Um, all right. All right. So what's next? So we've done. Okay. So we, yeah, let's let's talk about something else that is not experimental, but is coming in the next version because compose file, compose binary versions. I mean, if you want to read those tea leaves, we go back to the too too many tabs um, <laughs> here. So technically, version two point twenty four of compose is not out yet, but it should be out in the next few weeks in. Docker desktop. When I say it's not out yet, it's technically available in binary format, but most of us get Compose through Docker desktop. And so we got to wait for the next version of Docker desktop, which is already in a preview release. So we're expecting that in the days to weeks to come, not very long. And that will include version 2.24. It finally includes Docker Compose attach. So question for y'all out there. What is the difference between run create, exec, and attach. Ooh. Because those things all sound like they're letting you do something in a container, but they're all different. Okay. So let's see. Um, run is yeah. just running the container? Run yeah, running is like a combined. So what does is, what is create do? I'm... I'm, I'm this is not a test. You're allowed to say you don't know. But you, you probably know. So create just creates the container, but doesn't start it. Run yeah, Docker start would it. start it. Yeah. <laughs> Run does create, create plus pull plus start. start plus, yeah. And then what was the other two that you? Oh, uh, exec and attach. Okay. So what's the difference between those two? Exec runs a command in an existing container as an additional process, attach uh, connects your shell to the pseudo terminal of an existing process. So it doesn't create new processes for attach. Uh, attach is usually when, the, the, the reason I rarely use attach, but attach is often used when people want to run, let's say an Ubuntu uh, in the background. They just want to run a um, Debian or CentOS. They want to run something and they want it to stay running in a shell. Nothing's actually executing. Just the shell is sitting there waiting for them. They can do that with a run command, run command dash D and a dash IT and all various options will sort of let you run something in the background that's really just a shell. And the way you get back into that shell is with attach. If you did a Docker exec, it would create another shell, a second shell, Got it. which you may Got not it. want. Got it. Yeah. So now we have that in Compose. Big, big, you know, that's not that's not really a, <laughs> but it is yeah, something. Like, I don't think I've ever hit that use case yet <laughs> with respect to Docker Compose, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Ben, so, ben got it. Yeah, yeah, exec executes a command in the container. So it so attaches. It's not, oh, oh, the Go message ahead. disappeared. <laughs> but Ben, um, yeah, it's not an exec of like a, it doesn't create a new process. So attaches you're attaching to an existing process essentially. Yeah, yeah, you have to have attach attaches to the default process in the container, the one that was started when the container started. Exec is a is an additional process. You could technically have ten execs all running in separate shells into the same container, and then you would have the PID one 
or the 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 primary thing that was run, and then all these mm-hmm. exec processes that are running various things. And if you did a PS AUX, you would see them all as separate processes in that container's process list. And a lot of people maybe don't want that. Um, the big reason I would want an attach is that I can see the history. Of, yeah. So if I'm in a shell and that shell is running in the background all day long, and I detach and reattach to it, um, I can see my history of that shell. I can be, I yeah. can scroll up, I can do all that stuff. Um, but I can't with an exec because an exec is a new process, so it wouldn't have. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So apparently Nigel is the only one who's ever used it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, uh, and Nigel's a good friend of both of ours. Uh, he's been on this show, so we, we're, 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 yeah, Nigel. I mean, that's great. I mean, if someone if someone finds a real good reason to use some of these obscure commands, um, good on them because I'm just yeah. I'm just not the one to use it. Um, so that stuff is coming in the version two point twenty four. But over the last couple of years, there have been these ma- what I would call major new functionalities, and one of those we've mentioned includes, and then another mm-hmm. one is this watch sync. Um, mm-hmm. I have actually had shows last summer so if y'all are out you're watching this on youtube after the show is over go back and just search compose in this in the youtube in this live um just to prove if i go over here and search compose oh i gotta spell it i gotta spell it right yeah so there's this show but i wish it would sort it by by time but yeah, see right here, eight months ago, I did a short on the sync. I'm calling it sync, but it's really the watch command. And it's pretty easy to understand. So you can fit it in a 60-second short. There, I mean, there's lots of little nuances that I could probably spend an hour on, but I'm going to post this into chat so that you all later can go watch that 60-second short. And then even back in 2021, V2, was it was technically launched, but it wasn't in Docker Desktop by default yet. So we did a whole show about some of the new things in V2. Yep. Um, I feel like I saw one. Oh, are we going down memory lane again? We got to no. come back. Some, no, here's another short. Features? Here's another short. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've just been talking about Compose forever. So yeah. the I feel like for a minute, let's just show off the sync. Um, Yes. So I need to bring And, and this is handy because a lot of folks use Docker Compose for local development environments where the f- there's files changing all the time, but not all the files. <laughs> and uh, back to what you're talking about, like this, uh, the idea of like the, the bind mount uh, performance is impacted by not having additional information about exactly what's changing. And um, this kind of helps improve the performance of that use case, which is like using Compose as your, you know, using Docker and Compose to set up a development environment locally um, with, you know, while you're hacking away on on some kind of application or front end, back end, et cetera, right? Yeah. Yeah, the the um, I, I found this good demo here real quick. This will maybe not sound like necessarily a demo, but an example that kind of merges some of these ideas. So, um, well, actually, this one this one is just on this one is just on the include. It doesn't actually <laughs> it doesn't actually have the watch that we're talking about. So, oh, wait one, please hold. <laughs> so just to just to make sure that. These are separate topics, right? Include is about creating dependencies between Docker Compose files. Um, so you might have a main Docker Compose file with services, uh, backend services um, that don't change as, as frequently or are set up by another team. And then you have your own Docker Compose file for the application and the microservices that you're working on. And you include that other one so that as you're standing it up, you have that other team's work as well. Um, where, whereas Docker Compose Sync is about uh, keeping a file in files inside your container up to date with changes that are happening outside the container. Correct? Yeah. The the to me 
the watch command allows me to never need a bind mount for my source code or my source code dependencies. I can okay. completely avoid bind mounts if I want to for performance reasons. It's really it's it's really a feature for perform for solving performance problems, particularly on Mac or on Windows. If you are, uh, this technically can be a problem on Linux too. Um, but in Windows, if yes. you are keeping your source code files on Windows file system, which you technically shouldn't really be doing, but if you have a hard requirement to do that and you can't mm -hmm. put them in the WSL2 file system, which is my preference, which is what Docker recommends, which is what the internet basically recommends. You keep those files in the Linux file system. So you're, you're get in cloning VM. in Linux and yeah. then you have no performance problem. And there's also other little benefits like you can run shell scripts properly because Linux has the execute bit, but the Windows file system does not. So there's these weird idiosyncrasies between yeah. in a, NTFS, okay. yeah, SIFs, yeah, mm -hmm. and the various partition formats in Linux. So with the watch command, you can be on Windows, mm -hmm. clone into the Windows file system, run them in WSL2 Linux, and every time a file changes, and you can specify for these certain files, ooh, I just hit my mic. For these certain files, sync them. For these certain files, like the package JSON or the gem file, I need you to rebuild the image and then recreate the container automatically. Uh, which so you're you're, you're you giving it, you're giving yeah so you're giving Docker more information about what's what matters with respect to a full container build rebuild and what matters for just like a uh, REPL kind of loop like development yeah loop. yeah copy in this html that i just edited don't read don't restart the container don't rebuild it um and it they started so, with these two features action the action so, sync and action rebuild so for the folks that are listening to this at some point in the future um we have a Docker compose file with a section called watch and actions associated with that watch one, a sync action and another section, a rebuild section. So what are the, what's the difference between sync and rebuild here? Yeah, that's the, the sync is copy these files into the container while it's still running. And okay. so you would do that for traditional source code, things that don't have to be built, right. Uh, or yeah. installed or anything fancy run. It's just going to, Take a file from your host, put it into the same file path in the container based on your path and targets. You can even ignore things and say like, don't, if there's anything that changes in node modules for a node app, don't bother syncing them in because I'm probably going to need to do something else like rebuild the entire image because I have a new node module. And that is what this action rebuild can do. And I say that if the package JSON changes, I need you to mm -hmm. rebuild the image because as a part of that image rebuild, it will then do the NPM install. It, it sees the new package JSON, so it'll get the new packages, and then it'll recreate the container all for you, hopefully within seconds. Um, you know, NPM installs can sometimes take 15 minutes. Uh, it just depends well, on how- with, with cloud build, maybe faster. Yeah, because you can get cloud <laughs> builders. I looked, like if on the maximum plan, like the business plan, you can get uh, 16 CPUs, 32 gig of RAM in just a Docker build server. So that's that should be beefy enough for everyone's requirements. <laughs> I mean, there's maybe a really obscure one percenter problem of what, something that they probably shouldn't be doing in a Docker build that requires 64 gig of RAM, but 32 gig of RAM for a single image build probably is enough. Um, yeah. So they've actually added a third one of these that... Um, I meant to look up beforehand. There's a there's another need for well, what if I need you to run a command? Like maybe I'm using TypeScript, or maybe oh, I'm yeah. I need to compile something like uh, you know CSS. I need to I need to do something minification, whatever. And they've now added another action type, which is not in this blog post, to in order to do that. You can find all this out by the way. The Compose documentation is very up to date. The docs team, I see you. You're doing the you're doing the great work of the internet to keep us all up to date. So really most of the stuff, you can just scroll through the compose docs and find, you know, for example, let me just see if I can just off the top of my head, if I do Docker compose 
watch. And then, yep, it's already showing me. And it even tells you all this stuff. Like I haven't actually even read this page, so I didn't, I was just assuming that it existed because the docs are always so great. And uh, so we have action sync, action rebuild, and then path and target. Oh, so sync and restart. Sync, so this is the one that was is new, sync and restart. So for example, in Node-Land, not all programming languages are like this, but in Node-Land, um, if, it's, if you have like an index JavaScript or you have a server JavaScript file, like you have this initial file there and that changes, Node isn't gonna pick up the file changes because it's already pulled in the file. And so oh, you need to restart yeah. Node. And that's why you would have to do something like Nodemon or PS2, PM2 or like these other utilities. There's, cool. there's also yeah. one for React that's like a custom React web server. They're all meant to watch files and restart. Well, you don't need those utilities if you're just simply restarting. Um, yeah. It doesn't run build commands. I was wrong. It doesn't actually yet run special commands as a part of that process, but at least it will restart node and maybe you would have something in your compose file, like an entry point script that would maybe do some of that stuff if you needed to for development. I think sure. by the way, these three together, the it creates a, an incredible developer experience that's highly yes. performant, solves a lot of problems that people used to have other third-party utilities to solve, maybe even multiple third-party utilities. Um, yep. The one thing it doesn't do is a two-way sync, which we keep getting. I, I get asked on this show a lot of times when I talk about it. They want to know, well, what if I change a file in the container? How does it sync back out to my file oh, system yeah. if it's not, you know, if I'm doing changes inside there? And the answer right now is it doesn't. Like there is nothing in Docker inherently that watches for file changes inside a container and then does like a Docker copy back out. It just doesn't do it. So um, that's maybe a feature request. I think I've, I've specifically asked the Docker team about it, but I'm not sure if it's an official feature request. If you are someone who has that, you can always go to the Docker roadmap on Git, GitHub, GitHub slash Docker slash roadmap, and you can request that feature and other people can thumbs up it. Um, so, so yeah, so play with this stuff. We could honestly talk for another hour uh, or two about all the little nuances. If, you're, if you yes. thumbs up, by the way, we've got 23 thumbs up on this video right now. Um, people in chat, if you're interested in a more detailed list of everything, more compose on compose, <laughs> let's, let's clarify <laughs> on compose over the last two or three years of all the new changes. Yep. Oh, I got, we did, we got one. Um, give me a thumbs up on the video. And based on that response, I will look at our newsletter, which you, you got to sign up for brett.news. And I'll maybe put some of those more details in the list because I feel like there's probably a good 20 or 30 little things that are like at additional options or change behaviors that you maybe it maybe would impact you if you yeah. knew about it. So, so potentially like a top top 10, top 20 tips and tricks for Ooh. Docker Compose show. Yeah, there we up. go. I like the maybe. top. I like the top. Top 20 yeah. features and enhancements from 2022 to 2024. Yeah. So you want to watch out for what you want to include in your Docker Compose. Oh! <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap this show up. Yes. <laughs> so, so thank you all. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully this was, uh, thank you, Brett, for covering some of the new stuff in Docker Compose. Uh, uh, as always, uh, check out the newsletter with uh, some of these topics included at brett.news and also join us at the Discord. I'm going to do this right. Yay! Yes! Up here in the top right. Um, there are, what, what was the latest count? It was like 17,000 people. We're over 17,000 people in that Discord server. Yeah. Ooh, that yeah. number blows my mind. I don't know why you all are there, but I, I hear it's a cool place to be. So, you know, yeah, come hang tell out. Me. Um, yeah. And um, let your friends know about the show. Uh, this gets converted into a podcast sometime in the future. And um, so you can listen to our silky smooth voices on the road so and smooth. then catch up with the screen shares on YouTube. And let us know what what guests, what topics you would like us to cover in the future. We're always open to new ideas, and um, we're here to find those folks and get them on. So let us know. <laughs> we, we got a whole we have whole team meetings for planning people on this show. So 
Uh, we and we don't know everyone, so sometimes yes. the, the 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 recommendations and the call outs to certain Twitter profiles from you in chat get actually people on this show. So yes, I appreciate it. Thanks, Normal. Cool. I'll see you next week. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Brett. I'll see you next week. See you, everybody. <laughs>